to welcome everyone to the Global Initiative for Boys and Men uh, webinar today, where we're going to talk about uh, educational outcomes in the Pleasanton Unified School District with Sean here. How are you today, Sean? I'm doing well, Mark. How are you? Thank you for uh, getting us started here today. Welcome, everyone. Before we get started uh, and before Sean goes, I'm just going to share a little bit of information about GIBM. I've got a, a few slides here. How does that look, Sean? Great. Great. So um, we are the Global Initiative for Boys and Men, and we support the well-being of boys and men through research and advocacy. Um, we were founded in 2019, and we are a 501c3 organization. And you can find us online. Our website is www.gibm.us. And so we talk about supporting male well-being. What does that mean? Well, uh, through our research, we, we work with some of the leading experts in the world on men and boys are, you know, in our network. And so these are the six pillars that we have identified as our, our the biggest areas to focus on. Education, jobs, careers, and financial health, uh, fatherhood, family, relationships, physical and mental health, male narrative in the public discourse, and criminal justice system and court systems. Now, of course, a lot of these things are, of course, tied together. A good education can help you to a good career and good financial health. Um, you know, good family and relationships can lead to good mental health, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, all of these things are tied together, but we find it's important to categorize things and look at them. So today, of course, we're focusing on two primary things. First, of course, is education, because that's the subject of the talk is outcomes in education. However, the other big thing we're really doing today is about the male narrative in the public discourse, because what we find is that the data that we're going to talk about today that focuses on, uh, on boys in the Pleasanton School District is often the type of data that gets overlooked. And just a little bit more about what we do, we've got the Boys and Men's Wellbeing Index. We've created the first in the word world uh, well-being index for boys and men. There's several of them for women and girls. That is an in-process project. We hope to launch that later this summer. Uh, we also have a GIBM Boys and Men's Calendar, which is a free Google calendar that you can import that has days like International Men's Health Month, which is this month, or um, International Men's Day, which is November 19th and different dates throughout the year. Um, we're working to create government commissions on boys and men. Again, there are tons of these commissions for women and girls or non virtually none for boys and men. There's a couple, not very many. So we're trying to work on that. And we also have a lot of uh, webinars such as we're doing today and videos we have on our site and on YouTube. So uh, with that, we'd invite you to go visit that website, gibm.us. You can also read our strategic plan, read about news and media. And you can also donate, as we mentioned, we are a 501c3, it's tax deductible. I know a lot of companies also do matches and you know this webinar is free. And we also have uh, a baseball fundraiser. If you're a sports fan and collectibles, we have a number of autographed baseballs that we're selling this summer, including uh, Willie Mays and a bunch of other uh, Hall of Famers. So those are pretty sweet if that is something that you're into. So that's a little bit about GIBM. Again, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are going to be um, doing Q&A after Sean speaks. So Sean's going to speak for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to have Q&A and comments. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean. Sean Coleman, president of GIBM, welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Mark, and thank you uh, everyone for attending today's presentation of Pleasanton Unified School District and our sons, how PUSD is emblematic of California education's boy gender gap. You know, I started research on PUSD a number of years ago. I'm a transplant from the East Coast. I moved here just over 10 years ago. And I started looking at suspension data in the district and much of the same patterns I saw then back in 2016 are similar to today. And so one of the things I really want us to focus on is that data really does tell a story and why it's important to make sure we have a coherent narrative and complete data. And that begins with looking at the history of educational data, data and its context. And all that has to take place before we even begin to look at solutions. And so this is really the four components we're gonna look at today. And so when I say that data tells a story that offers insights, they really do. We might wanna argue that data can be cherry picked, but complete data really does give us insights. And so one of the things I really want us to focus on is understanding the identifiers and the categories and the clusters that we form that we're going to measure so that we can then really begin to solve. 
And one of the things that I like to look at is one of the greatest outcomes, and that is those who are attending four-year degree granting institutions and those who are going to college. And that national data tells us a little something about the boy gender gap. And what we noticed in 1980, boys were behind, underrepresented by about 500,000, just under 500,000. But as each decade increased, we saw this boy gender gap significantly increase. And we got to the point where boys were each year behind by 2.4 million each year underrepresented in four-year degree granting institutions. And so there really is this linear path we've known about for decades. And really, when I break it down even further, what you see is between 1980 and, and 1988 and 2003, boys are underrepresented in four-year degree granting institutions by about you know, one to two million consistently. From 2003 on, we see that number expand to over two million. And so part of that at least shows you the outcome and the correlatives of high school education, elementary education, and, and where we land. And some of that has to do with some of the policies that we make. And when we look at grant Pell Grants, for instance, we do see that our, our girls are, are, are more funded and we don't wanna see them be underfunded, that's for sure. What we wanna do is see that that gap gets closed. And when I look at the numbers, when we see that you know women are receiving over 6.2 billion more a year in Pell Grant funding, we really have to start looking at, hey, there's more of them in college and it makes sense, but we really have to look at these numbers here. And what we see is that you're more likely to receive a Pell Grant. And even when we saw Pell Grant funding drop, what we saw is the boy gender gap actually increased from 8.3% to 9.1%. So what we're beginning to see is how policy affects outcome. And that brings us to California and what's going on in California. And so what GIBM decided to do was to look at how we disaggregate data. And, and I really say this, any, any data that really looks at the outcomes uh, based on race, ethnicity, and don't include sex are, are really going to be incomplete. And what we see is that boys of all races are behind their female counterparts of the same race in graduating from high school and meeting college readiness standards. But one of the things that was troubling to me is although the high school graduation rates were 6.7 and we should be concerned about it, what we saw is the college readiness standards were 11.4. And so it tells me what's happening to our boys who are graduating from high school. Now, whether or not a, cho a, a child chooses to go on to college is one thing. Having this prerequisite skills is another. And so a student may choose to go on to become an electrician or a plumber, but we wanna make sure that that student has the same prerequisite skills as a college readiness student because literacy skills, math skills are gonna be essential. And so again, students who choose or do not choose to go to college is different from actually meeting standards. And so what we've seen is this steady, steady, um, uh, this, this just steady decline in literacy skills. And we've seen this steady, steady decline in college readiness skills. And when we look at the college readiness numbers, you know, over, two, over a 10 year period, you're gonna look at you know, 300,000 almost more boys who do not meet that skill set. And when we look at literacy skills, you're looking at 1.7 to 1.8 million boys who are not meeting literacy skills. And so when we look at those numbers, we begin to say, okay, there's this linear path that we can now understand how the boy gender gap in college happens. And that brings us to Pleasanton. And so when I decide to look at Pleasanton Unified School District data, I, I looked at the indicators that we see happening in districts across the state and districts across the country. And that boys are four to five times more likely to be suspended as, as girls. But what we also see is the same exact pattern. Literacy skills are smaller. College readiness skills are smaller. But also the, those who are diagnosed with a disability, males are 69% of those. And so the same patterns that happened in the state we're seeing happen in PUSD is that boys of all races are less likely to meet these standards as being of their counterparts of the same race. And one of the things I look at is cohort numbers. And so when I look at Pleasanton, the cohort numbers here are kind of small for African-American males and females and other populations. But what we can absolutely say is that they mirror what's happening with the state. 
And so we see, again, this linear path of how this happens. And so now when we look at, at, at the presentation on March 25th that Pleasanton did, and they presented the PUSD equity gaps, I think it falls prey to the, the typical way and the historical way we present data. And we often present data in terms of boys or girls or race. And so the PUSD equity gap chart really shows some things, right? But there's some alarming things, you know, the African-Americans are 10% of the suspensions. When we disaggregate that data further, what we really see is the group that's really struggling is African-American males. And, and so we see this gap, but what we really see is that boys are struggling the most. That when you look at one-time suspensions, boys are four of the top five in those 10 cohorts. When you look at multiple suspensions, boys are five of the top <laughs> five in those 10 cohorts. And then when we look at our disability population, that number goes up significantly more. That where we begin to see our, our male population of one-time suspensions for students with disabilities is 6.7 to one when you look at male to female ratios and 9.2 to one when you look at female, male to female ratios when you look at multiple suspensions. And so again, we're, we sort of start to see this pattern and I think the district is attempting to identify it, but whenever data is not disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and sex, you can to get conflated data. And that doesn't tell us a whole picture. And so one thing becomes very clear is that we notice that, that boys are on this downward decline, right? And we see them suspended more. We see that they have lesser literacy skills. We see that they're less likely to graduate from high school. And we see that they're less likely to meet college readiness standards. Now, Pleasanton might not be struggling with high school graduation rates, right? And we probably would expect that. It's got an affluent community, <clears throat> excuse me, with well-educated parents. And so there are things that are true and, and things that districts should be working on, which is to decrease the literacy gap and should decrease the college readiness gap. And those things are something I think the district should really be focusing on that wouldn't come out if you just didn't disaggregate the data fully. And one of the things I want to do is I actually want to go back a slide to the suspension data. You know, one of the things that district really needs to do, and I think all districts, and this is not a criticism as much as it's an opportunity. And I know that the district hired someone to look at equity and inclusion in Pleasanton Unified School District. I'm going to challenge Anderson Consulting to say, hey, this is a great opportunity for you to look at the boy gender gap in literacy and the boy gender gap in college readiness and the boy and the boy challenges when it comes to suspensions. Right. And one of the things that we need to do is disaggregate by types of suspensions. So a third grade boy might be suspended for his finger being a gun, as opposed to someone who might be suspended for assault. And those are two very different types of suspensions. But we need to start disaggregating that data as well. And if the district wants to spend its resources on this, I think a fuller presentation, including that data, is essential because we begin to then see, hey, some suspensions are absolutely warranted. And although the district has decreased the number of suspensions, I think since I last looked in 2015, 16, it really hasn't decreased the boy literacy gap and it hasn't decreased the boy college readiness gap. And so those are realities that I think the district has to, has to answer and it has an opportunity to do this now that it's brought in the consultant to do so. And so when I, I return to this again, I mean, this is something that we see happening not only in Pleasanton, but statewide, nationally. And so when I, when I think about, okay, how does this happen, right? And it all begins with data and educational data mining. And really, I, I, I'm not going to read the quote to you here. You all can look over it. But really, it's about forming clusters. And it's really about what is a cluster and who's forming a cluster, and that becomes incredibly important because when I look at the Pleasanton data, you know, I think it clustered, it, it clustered, it clustered in a way that wasn't complete. And that's why we get this misleading data and misleading information is because, because of that incompleteness. And so what does all this mean, right? Well, we know what a cluster is. It's a group. And I return to this again. We have to make sure that our groups are bro broken down by race, ethnicity, and sex we're always going to get an incomplete look at the data. And it's also going to conflate the data. And when I say conflate, again, we look at suspension numbers as a perfect example. And we also begin to see it in academic numbers. And although I've provided a table for Pleasanton Unified School District, I really would encourage people to look at the state data. 
because I think the cohorts are larger and large enough that you begin to see patterns. Whereas in Pleasanton, some of the cohorts may be smaller, but they still, they mirror the same pattern. And then we have to look at data and context and all that. What GIBM is recommending, and this is something the district can absolutely do, and I think it should be presented to parents every year in the district and should be accessible publicly. And that is number of students in each cohort. When you're preparing tables that you need to have student numbers or else, again, we disaggregate inappropriately. And the other thing is if you're gonna do it in academics and you're gonna do it in, in suspension data and other outcomes, we really need to look at race, ethnicity, and sex if we're gonna do it properly. In fact, I would encourage the district when it presents its data to have three major categories. One would be the total student population, a, which would include everybody. The second would be students with disabilities, and that would be in academic outcomes as well as suspensions and other data. And the third one might be inter-district transfer outcomes. I know that that might seem like a small population, but it, it, it again gives us an opportunity to look at different groups, how they're impacted, so we can give a fuller look at the resources we're going to spend as a district and where that money goes and what problem is it really going to solve. And so that kind of gives you a sense of data clustering, how data clustering can be situational and it shouldn't be. And so I think about the solutions to this. And before I, before I do that, I, you know, I, I always look at this data and I, and I need to tell a story. And there's a good friend of ours, uh, a couple, wonderful couple, the, the mother is an elementary school teacher with four boys. And, and she said something to me that was really meaningful. And she said, until I was a mother, I never really was as good a teacher. And I, to this day, I mean, even now it kind of moves me. It was so moving to me because it said, oh my gosh, she gets it. The district should be looking at this, this, this mother who is an elementary school teacher and saying, this is someone we need to train to help us better, better understand educating through a gender lens. And so I, I think that's part of the solution. But things that the district can immediately do is it can disaggregate data using GIBM templates. And we're gonna make those accessible to everybody here. You can technically make a public records request and ask for that information so we can empower you. The second thing is we're hoping the district will say, you know what, we're gonna list, we're gonna disaggregate appropriately. And at the end of the year, we're gonna, we're gonna have an entire set of tables. The parents can scan over the tables and see the data and have a clear understanding of what's going on. And this is something that should happen in every district in the state and probably in the country. The second thing the district needs to look at is how do we close the boy gender gap in literacy? And that's for every boy. That boys of all races, we need to close that boy gender gap in literacy. We also need to close the boy gender gap in meeting college readiness. And those should be goals that are part of Pleasanton and other districts' equity and inclusion programs. The other thing is educating through a gender lens, which is something I just talked about a moment ago, and the elementary school mother who is just gets it on such a deep level, but it was her experience of having four sons who do well academically, they're polite, they're respectful, they are wonderful young men, they care about their education. And I think part of that has to do with a mother who understood they do learn differently. And then the other thing, and this is, is something I think the school should at least look into, is single sex course offerings in co-educational settings, which can be done. I know this would be extremely progressive for a district like Pleasanton Unified. But again, I think they're in a unique position to lead the way for other districts in the state. And I'm sort of challenging them now to do this. And so these are sort of five of the solutions that we like to recommend. And three of them are immediately within the hands of the district. And these first three are easily within the hands of the district. But if you're going to look at education through a gender lens, it really is about bringing in groups who have had expertise, successful outcomes in teaching teachers to educate through a gender lens. And one of the groups I, I, I always think of, and, and I, I'm, I'm friendly with them, so I wanna disclose that, is the Gurian Institute does a tremendous job at doing this. And it's an organization districts should be looking at. They've received federal funding from, you know, for Title I schools, and they have a long history of a successful track record. And so these are things that can be implemented by the district. And so as it moves forward with its relationship with Anderson Consulting, I'm really hoping that they will say, you know what, we are going to look at this inequity and we are going to try to close that gap because we have actually seen 
the boy gender gap in literacy skills actually you know, you know, increase over the last several years. And so it's something the district needs to look at. And this is a kind of fast presentation and I really wanted to give the floor to you so you can ask questions and I'm gonna stop my uh, screen share now and feel free to ask questions and thank you for listening. Oh, one more thing, I apologize. I'm going to forward an email to everybody about how they can access data. I'm also going to forward an email to everybody about how you can access to our tables so you can find out what's happening at your district. Great, thank you very much, Sean, for that, uh, for that great uh, presentation and uh, lots of great information there. A um, lot of well done research. So thank you for sharing that. Um, again, for those of you who joined early, I know a few people got in a few minutes late. Uh, this is the, we are the Global Initiative for Boys and Men. We are a nonprofit organization uh, who supports the well being of boys and men through research and advocacy. So that's exactly what you're seeing uh, today. And we're going to start with some questions from, and by the way, so for everyone who's here live, uh, please go ahead, type any questions. We've got a couple questions in our Q&A. We've got a couple from next door from before, so we'll start with those. Um, first one we have is um, a comment, but it, maybe it's a comment that you could comment on, Sean. It says, uh, this is from Stacy from next door, and she says, I would really like to see PUSD collect data about the use of private tutors and other after-school academic programs. So then I guess the question is, how, you know, is that another part of the data we should be looking at because if the people have, act, if students have access to after-school tutors and all those college, you know, test preps and all that kind of stuff, um, does that make them more college ready? You know, yeah, I'm really happy Stacy asked that question because there has been a, one, one parent I remember, and this is in the, art, the article we wrote, which is referenced in the, in the slideshow, which will be made public. So if anyone wants to look at the slides, you'll have access to them. And a mother asked this question of the school board a number of years ago. And the response was, we don't ask parents about what they do with their, 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 their preference to how they deal with their income. But I think it does tell something about disparities. And I think this is the type of questionnaire that could be designed by an appropriate company, to be honest, and how that could be dis sent to parents. We need to know so that we can help those students who may be struggling. If one of the benefits the district gets out of parents who hire private tutors is their students are more likely to meet literacy skills and other skills, college readiness skills. And so there may be an inequity there. And I can give you a perfect example, <clears throat> excuse me. And that is a mother who came to me and her son has a reading difference and he was struggling. And we're trying to work it through the district but they have the resources and were frustrated enough where they said, you know what, we're just going to hire someone. And so they hired a private tutor to work with their son and his literacy skills. And we, we saw, right. So the school kind of benefits indirectly or actually directly from parents with resources that can hire private tutors and create greater outcomes that are based on something else. And so I, I think we really need to, to look at that a little bit more seriously. Right. Thank you for that. And, um, there's another question here. This one is from Annie. And the question is, do you look at disability data? And she used the word disability in quotes for some reason, like ADHD. And I am wondering uh, also, when you have that disability statistics there in your presentation, uh, which of the, what disabilities are, is that any sort of disability at all? Is that specifically learning disability or? So yeah, could you talk about, about that? Learning disabilities. And you know, what GIBM did is, and you know, we have so many tables. And when we put this, it could have been a 25 page report, if you want to be honest, but I would really strongly encourage people to go to our website and go to this specific article, which again is referenced on the slideshow. It's, it's, it's the intersectionality of race, sex, race, gen, race, ethnicity, and sex. And if you look at that article at the, at the appendix, we actually list the disability outcomes of students and suspension data and things like that. Um, we, we are looking at even deeper data, how students with disabilities do in even AP courses. So there's going to be more, more data we are going to request from the district. And I really just wish this data was presented every year at the end of the year. Because once you put this data together and you do running tables, it becomes easier to, to follow this data all along the way, right? And so I would we've done that. So if anyone wants, it's table B1. And table B1 in the appendix actually shows you the disparities in students with disabilities who are overwhelmingly male, 69%. Great. Um, next question is from Karen. 
on Nextdoor. Karen, as a stats major in college eons ago, I am so impressed with your research. I'm also the mother of two boys and the data you collected is pretty sobering. In addition to your proposed solutions, hiring teachers that more or less mirror the student body in terms of race and sex could result in better outcomes for males and minorities. The dilemma is, of course, not to impede the progress of women in favor of another group. I can only hope that equity in schools is not a zero sum game. Well, I, I'm really happy that she asked that question because when we talk about equity and zero sum games. This, these are not about zero sum games. I do think we can benefit both our sons and our daughters by educating through a gender lens. And I think that's how you do it. And I think the perfect of the mother who's an elementary school teacher with four sons, you know, she has lived experience, right? But not everybody has that lived experience. And she also dug deeper. She's, she's very smart. She's very savvy. And she looked deeper and went into the data a little more, uh, or at least went into the research a little more. And I think that's a way to answer that question is by looking at how boys and girls learn differ ed differently, educating through a gender lens. I think we can teach males and females how to better educate boys and girls. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, um, what do you have any understanding of what are the trends? Oh, this is from uh, Mark, by the way. Uh, what are the trends over the last 10 to 20 years regarding suspension rates of, uh, of students, you know, regarding gender and race? So have, the, have these has suspensions been going down? Have they been going up? And is it the same for boys and girls? And it's the same for different races? Well, I think it depends on the district you're in. You know, okay. we, we've remained pretty steady that boys are pretty much 75, 80% of suspensions. But what I'd like to carry that a little bit further, although we decrease, I think if we increase literacy skills and we increase other skill sets, kids get suspended less. They want to be in school more. And I like to think of this this way is, you know, um, if we can do that, I think you'll see the suspension data change. And mm -hmm. we are seeing that, again, it's pretty consistent that the suspension rates continue to disfavorably show, show boys are struggling more. I do think, you know, one thing I like to talk about is the, the history of data. And, you know, historically, I'd say minority students have struggled more. I and mean, I think that's, that's, that's a fact, uh -huh. particularly Native American males, Alaska Native males, and African American males. The one consistent thing, though, is that boys of all races continue to be suspended at higher rates, can, you know, comp compared to the female counterparts, and consider to do considerably do worse in meeting literacy skills and the other skills. So yes, we just seem to see consistency in that suspension stuff. All right. So I guess, I, Mark, I hope that answers your question. It sounds, you know, the, the trend has not changed. The trend has been the same, whether it's gone up a little, down a little overall, we would have to really dig into the numbers, but okay, thank you. Next question is from Matt. And Matt asks, any idea of what the boys who aren't going to college are doing instead? Uh, you know, I, that's a great question. I, I think we need to look at greater emphasis on trades. And that means still having them college ready. I don't think the trades programs has been have been as robust as they need to be. And that all depends on economies. You know, manufacturing economies are smaller, right, than they used to be in the United States, where other economies are growing. And so I actually think we need to look at the Pell Grant system funding certain programs that lead to trade, trade, pro, trade schools, where if a student wants to go on and do something that they could be receive a Pell Grant to go on into a trade. But we do not invest enough in our trade schools. And we have to look at things other than the four-year college track as a successful way to students. So to answer your question, Mark, we aren't, we aren't doing enough in, in that arena. Yeah, I guess, do, we, do we have an idea of how many um, boys, for instance, are just simply unemployed and not going to school versus going into the trades? Because that, that is an argument that a lot of people say, oh, there are fewer boys, you know, or young men in college, but there are more of them in the trade. So well, boys it, between, we boys, know what the numbers are. Boys between the ages of, say, I think it's uh, 22 and 33 are financially not doing as well in major cities. And that tells you a little bit of what's going on. And so we do know that they're not doing as well in that 22 to 32 age bracket they tend not to do as well financially. And I think, again, this is a really complicated issue, but I think it speaks to what is happening. So what happens after 32, 33, 34, but there definitely is a gap there in those, in those um, 22 to 32 years. Got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, this question comes from Allison. Allison asks, college readiness is the paradigm of optimal pursuits since different learning styles lead to a variety of strengths and skills 
a variety of strengths and skills areas, uh, could we expand the focus? So I guess expanding the focus of what it means to be college ready. So, sounds like what she's asking. It's funny. You can tell Allison has the background in education. It's a great question. <laughs> you can tell. Uh, you know, Allison, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we do need to expand the focus of what college ready means. And, and I, I tie that back to what I said earlier, right? That choosing to go to college or not go to college is one thing. Being college ready is another. And I do think we need to expand that focus, particularly in literacy skills and math skills, right? Maybe we need to start looking at those skills a little bit more intently so that we can really give someone a base, a sound base to perform well academically, whether they choose to go to college or not. But we absolutely need to expand that focus. And there you go. Okay. I hope that answers Great. the question. All right. Thank you. And if we've got time for a few more questions, so if anyone else has one, please don't be shy. You can, you can also put it in the chat or the, or the Q and A we're, we're checking out both. Um, Next question, this one also comes from Mark. Uh, the national data on the gender gap has been known for years. I guess, you know, the education gender gap has been known for years. Why has there been no national effort toward addressing this? So for instance, that slide you showed, that great animated slide uh, that you showed earlier, this is not a new thing. It's gotten bigger. Uh, the, the gender gap has gotten bigger, for instance, looking at the college graduation rates. Uh, I, I think there's been policy decisions. I mean, the policy decisions have made this possible. So, for example, California has a California Commission on the Status of Boys and Men. And mm -hmm. it's... You mean women and girls. I mean, I'm sorry, it does not have a... <laughs> boys and men. Thank you, Mark. Has a California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. It needs one on boys and men. But this is a publicly funded thing that looks at all sorts of measurables, <clears throat> academic outcomes, health outcomes, health insurance outcomes, and it presents to the legislature. So this is what's happening at a state level. But when we look at it nationally, and this isn't, you know, cr critical, this has been going on for decades, you know, the Biden administration created the, the um, Gender Policy Council, but it's not a Gender Policy Council, it's a council for women and girls, and I think we need to support that council. There should be one for boys and men so we can follow these trends and we can report on them. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I don't want to get too far off, off the topic here, but we've known for decades that that boys are behind and people say, well, what do these policies do? And we look at what they've done. Right. They've helped our daughters excel in school. They've helped in all sorts of areas. We need to start doing the same for our boys and men. And I personally sort of find them, um, you know, a violation of civil rights because we're saying one group of people should we should report on how they're doing and another group of people were not. And I think a perfect example is COVID-19 you know, 60 to 70 percent of COVID deaths are male. And so now imagine releasing a gender policy council in the midst of a pandemic where 60 to 70 percent of those dying are male. And so now, you know, right. So and then we've known for decades about the boy gender gap in college attendance and college engagement. And so, you know, part of this happens because of policy decisions, including PUSD's decision to look at inequities in the district, but have an entire presentation that doesn't even address boys, even though the data clearly shows they're struggling. Got it. Now, don't, don't be shy, folks. If people have any other questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. We have, but we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, let's bring it back to Pleasanton for a minute. So um, in Pleasanton, tell us a little bit more about uh, the person that has been hired and do they have a mandate? You know, the person hired is Nicole Anderson of Anderson Consulting and her mandate, at least I believe when I watch the March 25th board meeting, is to look at systemic problems in the school district and to look at unconscious bias and to and, and other implicit biases. And I think that is a that is a really difficult thing to unpack. And I just to be totally honest, because if, if it believes there is a problem in systemic race throughout the school district or systemic problems in other ways, not addressing boys might actually show an unconscious bias on the part of the district, right? And so her mandate is to look at these things. So I'm hoping that she will say, hey, you know, GIBM presented some data that we really need to look at seriously and change that. And so I do think there is a mandate. The challenge is, again, the data is incomplete. 
And until we are prepared to unpack it fully, again, the, the district made a decision, I think, on data that's incomplete. Yeah. Um, great. Now, the next question, uh, again, for Matt. Thank you, Matt, for your question. Is there any example of a government, state, county, or even a school district who has an agency for boys similar to the ones that are common for girls and women? Is any state doing it right or putting attention on it at all? So I can answer that one because I've got a lot of experience in that as well. Because, um, yeah, it was in California where I uh, saw that there was a California State Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. I also live in the city and county of San Francisco. San Francisco also has a commission on women and girls, none for boys and men as well. Uh, so I did some research that the California Commission for Women and Girls, the State Commission, this year is getting over $10 million. Uh, so, uh, and in some places, there are cities and counties that have. Uh, status of women and girls commissions. For instance, a girl in Berkeley has, city of, city of Berkeley has something, the county has something, the state has something. And then as Sean mentioned, there's the National Gender Council. She has, and actually the UN has something for women and girls too. So she's got five levels of organization, at least looking out for her well-being, doing data, doing research and informing policy decisions where there's nothing like that. Now you asked, are there, is there anything for men at all? So there are a few things. Um, and they're very small and they're not as much. So here in the state of California, what there is, there has been somewhat of a push for boys and men of color. So there is something called the Select Committee on Boys and Men of Color. There's one in the assembly and there's one in the California Senate, um, but that's limited to you know, people of color. There's a disagreement on exactly what they mean by of color. So it's unclear exactly who is even included in that commission. I support that commission, uh, those uh, select committees. I think they're doing great work, but I'd also like to see more attention brought to all men and boys because uh, when you see something, you know, bad in the news, you see bad outcomes happening with boys and men, does it really matter, uh, you know, their race? I mean, we, we see things happening in all communities. And so I'd like to see it broader. Um, President Trump created a commission on the status of black boys and men. So again, that was just for African-Americans. Um, so that's even a more narrow focus. Some people said, uh, well, I'll just leave that at that. I won't comment any further on that. I don't wanna get into politics here, just, just policy. So that was created. Um, there are smooth, uh, the city of Washington, DC has one. Uh, Staten Island created a council, but it has not been particularly active. So. Um, oh, Sean. Oh, Sean. Yeah, how are you, Mark? Sorry, I had to. Oh, good. Go ahead, go ahead. something going on in real life. So anyway, so to answer your question, very, very little. There have been a few states that have occasionally had one. New Hampshire had one for a while. Um, I think it was Alabama had one for a couple of states have had these commissions sort of pop up for a little while. They get a little bit of traction. And then uh, it, it sometimes when the party switches power, um, uh, the commission gets disbanded. So. You know that that sometimes happens in you know party politics. One 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 party wants to have a certain commission, and the other party comes into power. They disband the previous commission, and then you know you got to start all over again. So good question, Matt. Thank you to get into, there's no there's no real concerted effort, and and I really think it's important to have both both groups. To be totally honest, because I think when you're focused on girls and women's issues and you're focused on boys and men's issues, you're really allowed to to track. Hey, we need to focus on these issues. So I think if we have one, we should always have another just because it allows us to look at, at policy and it allows a group to actually focus on a specific, specific group. So I think that's really important, Mark, go ahead. Right, and uh, yeah, and June, June, by the way, is uh, Men's Health Month. There's a great organization called Men's Health Network. So there are a lot of advocacy organizations for men. Uh, there's the Movember Foundation, which is a men's health advocacy network, which you know does their stuff in, uh, um, um, uh, in November, they, they do a great, great bit of fundraising for research for prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and also mental health awareness and suicide prevention, which is just absolutely fantastic stuff. So there are some organizations doing well. Um, for those who are looking for other data, I mean, I really encourage you to go to the GIBM.us and look at some of the articles we've written. All our data is verifiable and reliable. We, we've collected data from the National Center of Educational Statistics. CDC, National Institute of Health. So we are really compiling data that is incredibly important. We're using reliable resources. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, great. Another question here, kind of a follow-up from what we were just talking about. 
uh, an anonymous attendee asks, I believe it was President Obama, not Trump, that did a commission for fatherhood based on race. I don't know about a fatherhood commission. I know he was very supportive of that. And he also created a nonprofit organization. And the nonprofit organization is called My Brother's Keeper. And that is an organization for young men and boys of color, which they define, their organization defines of color as Latino, African American and Native American. So their original definition did not include, for instance, Asian. Of course, it does not include white people. That's their choice. It's their definition. Um, so they, and he might have had some other fatherhood commission too, as well. I'm not familiar enough with his work, but he did create. And again, fantastic organization. It's a great organization. My brother's keeper. They just had a big national conference in Oakland about two years ago with Steph Curry. The stage was, you know, Steph Curry, Barack Obama, and John Legend. I mean, if you could imagine that, you know, the charisma on stage is fantastic. They're doing great work. Uh, we support them too, but our work is more inclusive. We're trying to have a more inclusive. Uh, brand, a more inclusive organization that includes people of all races, all abilities, all sexualities, all ability levels, all ages. We're trying to be more inclusive than those other organizations. That's one thing that makes us different. Yeah. And I, and I think that, again, shows what happens at district levels, right? When we when we, we choose clusters uh, w- that don't disaggregate appropriately, we get misleading information. And so we need to make sure we do that. And And I would encourage you know, us to look at if one particular group is struggling, that will become very transparent in a council on boys and men or a school school district report on boys, all that will become transparent, which we've done already. We've shown that there are groups that are more, more marginalized than others, but that doesn't mean the other groups who are marginalized should be discarded, right? And so we have to make sure we're being aware of that. Yeah. All right. Well, we're getting close to uh, 1145. I want to thank everyone who joined us today, uh, who signed up online and joined us for this uh, webinar on a on a beautiful Thursday morning here in Northern California. And from wherever you are, hope you're having a, a great day. Sean, thank you so much for that great presentation. Any final thoughts? Uh, I really would encourage parents to reach out to the district. I would encourage parents to say, are you going to start disaggregating data by race, ethnicity, and sex? And what are you going to do to close the boy literacy gap in, in the boy literacy gap? And what are you going to do to close the boy college readiness gap? I think those are fair questions for parents to ask. I also would ask, would you consider educating through a gender lens? I put some of my solutions together. We will follow up with an email on, on our website. We do have a, a, an Excel spreadsheet that includes every imaginable cohort you can think of. If you want to get specific information from your district, but I think we have to encourage our districts to release data tables at the end of every single year that are based this way. And that way everyone knows what's happening. And then we can really think about what are we going to do to solve the problems for groups that are struggling. And that's the goal, help every child who struggles. That's always the goal. Excellent. And on that, I think we're gonna close out. Again, thank you everyone. We are the Global Initiative for Boys and Men. And you can find us online at www.gibm.us. We will be posting this webinar if you'd like to share it with others in the future, uh, as well as other webinars we're doing. And you can follow our development of the BAM Index, and you can also subscribe to our Google Calendar, the GIBM Boys and Men's Calendar. So on behalf of Sean and myself, thank you very much, and have a great day. Hi, everyone. Thank you.